Perfect. So hello, I'm Kate Williams. I also work for the Washington Department of Natural Resources with, as a prescribed fire planner. I'm also the secretary and one of our directors for the Washington Prescribed Fire Council. Um, I identify as a fire practitioner, not necessarily a firefighter, and I'm also a very happy dingo owner. Um, in terms of education and qualifications, I received my bachelor's of science in forestry and wildland fire management from Humboldt State, now Cal Poly Humboldt in Northern California. And I actually was about two credits short of a minor in music. So um, Heather, I saw from your presentation that you were another music forestry nerd that happened to go through, but uh, yep, didn't, didn't want to get that minor in French horn performance. Um, I did complete some graduate forestry coursework, but Nicole, your question is right on. I did not complete my master's program. So I started a master's program and I got way too far in before I figured out that it was not what I was looking for in my master's program. So um, I bowed out of that. I took my credits. I am looking at potentially finishing another master's program at another point, but I don't know if that will be in forestry necessarily. So. Um, Lots of ways that you can go get a master's. Not all of them have to be necessarily a research focus or even a master's of science. In terms of fireline qualifications, firefighter one, IT five. Um, I'm single resource qualified, so fire firing boss. I'm not really looking to go much beyond that. I'd love to work on heavy equipment someday, but I am not aiming for my division down the line. Um, I fall much more in like the FEMO and fire effects. I've got my FOBS task book open right now, hoping to work on that eventually, but I've also gone into the plan side of IMT management. So um, I opened up my status check-in recorder when I joined DNR, got that signed off, and I've been working on situation unit leader. So um, really like to highlight that there are other pathways in fire behind besides just operations, and all of them are essential to make the team work and to get folks paid and to get folks to the right place. So um, operations are great, but there's there's also other ways to go down a fire career pathway. Personally, in terms of interest, gardening and botany is is my my comfort hobby. Um, love love growing things. My bachelor's in in forestry was really what opened my eyes to kind of the surface vegetation in the woods. Um, I'll go into my career pathway for a while, but um actually doing the fire effects monitoring and learning how to categorize plants really opened up my eyes to get into gardening. And it's been really soothing uh, in the shoulder seasons. Also love cooking with stuff that I grow, reading, anything and everything. Board games and trivia, which has actually kind of developed a, a lot of, <laughs> led to the development of a lot of work task flows that I love puzzle solving and love um, just working with teams to, to get to a solution. Um, big fan of yoga, dance, and running. Used to be a really big trail runner, trying to get back into it. And then just generally building community. Um, teamwork is a really powerful thing when it comes together and finding that flow with a group of folks is really unmatched. Um, start of my journey, as I mentioned, I was a minor in music and I knew that I wanted to go to college for forestry and work towards fire ecology. I, I saw a museum exhibit when I was probably in junior high and saw a photo of two women acting as fire effects monitors for the National Park Service in Southern California. And was like, you can go and just like do science on fire and that's a career? That, that sounds amazing. Sign me up. Um, but to get to college, I had a music scholarship. And so for the first semester or year, I was actually a music major at my, my university. Um, helped me get in before I could start taking my forestry classes, joined up with our logging sports team, started working on some actual hard skills to help me when I got to the fire line, um, developed some fitness. And then my very first job with the Forest Service was the summer after my freshman year when I actually got hired on as a data entry technician for a Forest Service research station and typed data for 20 hours a week all summer. And at the very end of the season, they invited me to come for a two-week field tour and backpacked up to Yosemite and got to cut um, those little metamorphs. So that was my introduction to field work. And I was not sure if it was going to be for me. It was <laughs> um, a lot of very focused field collection, but I loved working with folks and getting paid to camp in Yosemite was pretty unmatched. Heather mentioned that there's a lot of folks that have bumped around in those careers, and I am definitely one of them. 
So right after the summer that I got hired to be that data entry technician, I got picked up to be a timber stand improvement technician um, over in Nevada for the Forest Service. And I did a lot of mastication layout for the fuels tech. So I was working directly for fuels. Um, it was a great position. At that time, we had the STEP program through the Forest Service, which I think now is the Pathways program. But essentially, they came to my college. They recruited me to come in. Um, they got me my, my red card. I went to guard school. Um, day to day, I was going and just marching through the woods, either on my own or with a partner, laying out mastication units. And then I got sent to fires. I think they were sending me out as a radio tech, but um, was really just a gopher for the IMT, which was amazing. I've got to fill in to all these different positions. I was living with um, the hot shots at that time. Ended up making it to my first fire at the end of season. So this photo of me is at the end of my summer getting out of my very first fire. And it I, I was hooked. I signed me up. <laughs> so I then applied. Um, I actually got recruited for a type 2 IA crew in Northern California. I was performing for a timber sports competition. And a woman walked up to me afterwards. And she asked if I would like to get a job on a hand crew. And gave me the name and number for the local hand crew captain. I know Nolan mentioned cold calling jobs that you think you might like. They essentially came and recruited me and she she told me to cold call this guy and ended up spending two seasons for this type 2 IA in NorCal and learned how to run a chainsaw, learned how to run a crosscut saw. Um, was really great work, got sent all around. First fire, first big campaign fire was down in the Wallow, down in New, Mer New Mexico, Arizona. Um, just great few seasons learning what fire was all about, getting to see it, um, get my hand on a torch for the first time and really realized at that point that prescribed fire was much more my jam than pure suppression. Um, a lot of suppression was very reactive and you're always just kind of moving. Uh, folks don't always know why, but when we would go to prescribed fires, it just seemed like there was a lot more intention. There was a lot more description of what we were doing, what we were looking for. and so really wanted to go down the pathway and kind of work towards fire ecology with more of a prescribed fire emphasis. Um, after I worked on the crew, I completed my bachelor's, graduated, and ended up going working for the National Park Service for Yellowstone National Park for a few seasons as a fire effects monitor. So again, kind of a Jill of all trades job of primary job duties for going out, um, laying out a bunch of monitoring plots, but we were still primary fire. And so Went out with the engine on a lot of assignments, went out with type two crews. Um, this was an assignment that we got to go to outside of Missoula that still to this day is one of my favorite fire assignments of just great group of people. Um, was primary hell attack for the park when the actual hell attack was out doing short haul. So got trained on how to do short haul. Um, did a lot of radio operate, not radio operations, but uh, radio maintenance throughout the park, fixing the remote auto automated weather stations Really, if you're into diverse fire jobs, can't can't say anything bad about fire effects monitoring. You get to do a little bit of everything. Um, in my off season, while I was fighting fire, I worked as a nanny and a preschool substitute teacher. So lots of folks don't necessarily mention what they do in the off seasons, but once I finished up school, I still wanted to work. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but it didn't really feel emotionally like it was that big of a difference of you're helping take care of people's needs as a senior firefighter in the summer. And then in the off season, you're also just helping take care of people's needs. They're just a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, but I loved it. It gave me the opportunity to travel also um, in the off season and really like fill your cup. And then after I was finishing up my time at the National Park Service, I realized that I might want to go for a master's. Nicole, again, to your question of how what was the trigger that made me think it was time was I really wanted to be a fire ecologist and everybody that I talked to at the National Park Service told me that you should go get a master's just because competition wise, the new fire ecologists that were being hired had at least a master's, if not a PhD. And it was becoming pretty much a requirement for that, that level job. So um, I went to a graduate school over on the, the West Coast, uh, TA'd for some fire ecology classes. Again, I wasn't getting the skill development that I was really looking for. So being out of school, I really wanted to work on GIS skills, a lot of those kind of really technical planning skills that I hadn't been able to work on much in my undergrad and really wasn't working on as a dirt firefighter. 
Um, even as a fire effects monitor, I was not being asked to do any sort of GIS work. And it just happened that in my program for my specific degree, that wasn't what I was ended up doing. So um, I was still working in the summers, got on in Central Oregon on a module that they were, the Chutes National Forest was trying to build at that time. So I took my skill set from the National Park, tried to bring it to the Chutes, got to do a bunch of prescribed fire with them, which was great. Um, ended up leaving Forest Service as a firefighter and just working in the summers as a fire research tech. So I worked for WETAC, which is like the Western uh, Environmental Threat Assessment Center, and essentially continued doing fire effects monitoring just as a dedicated research tech. They were kind enough to let me keep my red card so I could go and work overtime on the weekends, um, helping out the local district running an engine, and then in the fall went and um, helped with burning down at the Nature Conservancy site, Ken Marsh, actually, and made some great connections through prescribed burning in that capacity. Um, that ended up actually helping me get a job with the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina in the winter. So as I was kind of closing the door and figuring out I did not want to finish my master's degree, um, I ended up bouncing between North Carolina in the winters and then Central Oregon in the summers. So continued to kind of lead monitoring crews. At that time, I switched over to um, run a crew for Oregon State University in collaboration with the Forest Service. So the Blue Mountains Partnership, which is kind of based over in Mouser County, they were looking to do this collaborative monitoring. I led that crew in the summer and then would bounce back and actually keep up my fire skills. Um, did a lot of work on my firing boss in the winters down in North Carolina. And then I finally got my permanent job. I will add that I worked for probably two or three years applying anywhere and everywhere to try and get a perm job with Forest Service. Um, my dream at that point was to become a fuels technician and then work my way up to fire colleges. And I could not get a job offered. <laughs> so for three, three seasons, I cold called folks. I worked on my resume. I asked them what I was missing. I tried to build those skills, couldn't get it. And so finally this um, job opened up with the Forest Stewards Guild, which is now the Ember Alliance. So they were standing up in all lands prescribed fire module and we're looking for a prescribed fire planning specialist and the job duties just seemed to fit with what I was looking for, ended up applying, getting that. I only worked with them for about a year before this DNR position opened up and I ended up coming over to state, but um, also to what Nolan said, really keep an eye out and broad. If you have a, a direction and a goal that you're working for, look beyond the agencies. There's a lot of great jobs out there. They come through the job boards. Um, talk to your networks, let them know what you're interested in. But I got a lot of experience in my one year with um, the Amber Alliance. We burn for a ton of folks, different agencies, pretty much always on the road <laughs> um, at that time, but it was a great experience. And since I've come to DNR, I've cycled through a few positions, but originally was hired as a fire ecologist. And now, like I said, acting as a prescribed fire manager so or prescribed fire planner. So looking at statewide scale, where do we, the state, at an all lands level, really want to engage and encourage prescribed fire development? Things that I enjoy about fuels and fire. Um, generally, I love this st strategy and planning that comes with firing. So again, I love puzzles. I love trivia. I love games. I love that collaboration. And something that I've found really about fuels and prescribed fire specifically is that it's always kind of treating your mind at tricking your mind into this, this puzzle scenario. So burning in North Carolina to me was one of the most fun jobs of down there. Our crew would switch between different agencies. Um, and most of the time you'd show up, you'd have no idea what the unit looked like. You'd be handed a map. You'd be told, okay, we're going to fire this unit. And you had essentially maybe 20 minutes or a half hour to go and get eyes on the full unit. And then you'd be asked to fire it. And if you're a big fire nerd like me, it was a great place to really, one, play with fire and learn what fire behavior looks like in a, a series of environments, but two, just puzzle solve. If things aren't going well, if folks aren't responding the way that you want them to, it's such a good career to really just like constantly adjust. And, and I just find it very gratifying. But second big thing that I love about fire that Nolan also talked about is the friendships and the relationships that are built. Um, Going through my whole plethora of fire photos that I haven't looked at in probably five years, I realized that um, this big laugh is like constant. 
and I never really noticed it in my photos, but um, you work with great people and work with great people that make you laugh and make you feel part of something bigger than yourself. So it's a really easy place to kind of find meaning if, if you're looking for that. In terms of challenges when it comes to job, Nolan touched on some great ones. Um, the number one thing that I will also bring up that includes some smoke management is just politics around fire and specifically prescribed fire. Um, we don't necessarily manage in a way that practices what we preach. The science is definitely not, I will say the politics is not caught up to the science. We're still working through a lot of it, but just with bureaucracy, things can move very slowly and it can be very frustrating for managers sometimes. Of You have the social license, you have folks that wanna burn, you have the resources and still there's all these barriers that are in the way, but, um, more and more get broken down and some will still continue to pop up, but you know, big picture, long-term making progress. Second big challenge I would say is the increasing workloads that are placed on individuals and resulting burnout. So Nolan also touched on this, but there's a lot being asked of individuals that they were historically not trained to do. So we're asking firefighters to, to learn skill sets much beyond uh, what they, typically been taught and to do it very quickly and to do it very well and safely. And so um, there's a lot of stress right now that I feel across agencies to do more, to have individuals doing more. Um, and we're adjusting, I think folks will, it'll kind of be this expansion and, and collapse in terms of expectations that there's, there's gonna be a limit to what folks can reasonably do. And third to me, the challenge is just all of the data that comes in. So using data in the science, is just this constant inflow of information. There's all of these tools. It's really difficult as a manager sometimes to track with the newest and best sciences and how to apply it. And so it just can feel like your brain's gonna explode sometimes when you have all of these different groups working on very similar projects. And sometimes they talk to each other and it's a very coordinated effort, but oftentimes you're just getting all of this information laid on you. And you as the manager then having to decide how to apply it in the best way to get the results that we're all looking for. Um, great example is heard for a while that they were gonna be using drones to track individuals on expanding initial attacks and have essentially all of the resources, live action tracked on an iPad that they would give to the IC. And it was like, why? why? It's so much information for one person to track. That is why we divide up why you try and limit the amount of moving parts that folks are are trying to track. Um, and so sometimes it's really dialing down to the essentials of what is the job that you're trying to do? What information do you need? What's the most efficient way to get it? For the KSAs, a lot of them overlap with what Nolan covered, but some of the big ones of knowledge, just general interplay, not only of weather fuels and topo, but also what your action is on the landscape. So that human input is often missed when we think about fire behavior. And I know a lot of Heather's classes talk about the classic, um, when we're out and we're doing prescribed fire and everybody's strip heading and every time you burn the unit, you walk in the same path. And that tends to have uh, effects later on on not only what your vegetation is, but then what your fire is doing each time. It, being able to tune into the nuance of that, especially at the level when you're in the field at the project is really big. Um, a lot of folks don't necessarily see the impact that they have on, on the operation. So I'd say be really cognizant of fire dynamics in general, but also your individual impact to it. Navigation is huge. Um, a lot of us have moved away from paper maps, but can't say enough about knowing how to use a paper map and find yourself um, on a landscape without your phone and or internet and GPS support. General ecology, um, a big one that I would harp on is mechanical knowledge. So being a jack or jill of all trades and knowing how to start and fix things is very key. Um, everybody loves a fixer. Um, human psychology in general, having some self-awareness of not only what's going on with you, but also within your team, your organization, um, knowing when you're gonna hit those pressure points and how folks tend to react. Generally, GIS and tech, it is a constantly evolving part of FIRE that just keeps getting more and more embedded. 
And you'll find that if you have a good understanding of GIS and tech, you'll go very far, very quickly. <laughs> um, and then generally policy and politics. Not everybody manages their land for the same reasons and in the same way. And having just some general knowledge about what the big no-nos for certain land managers is really key and critical of National Park Service will manage their lands, their fires, their fuels in a very different way than the state. Um, skills. Communication is number one. I know Nolan also put it as number one, and it's um, really invaluable, not only to verbally be able to share your ideas or have <laughs> absorb others, but also to be able to write it out. Um, more and more folks, I feel, are, are getting away from this true skill of written communication and what you're trying to get across and how you're communicating it. Um, problem solving, multitasking, and project management. I really wish that in either my undergrad or my master's, they had had a class on project management. And I'm pretty flabbergasted that we don't teach more students about general project management of tip to tail, what that looks like, um, the details involved with it, and specifically targeting it, not just assuming that folks will pick it up as they go through other classes. Um, delegation is a really big one. If you tend to be a person that says yes to everything, it's a true skill that you have to cognizantly work on and be very intentional about. Fitness, both physical and mental. Um, keep your mind in good shape, keep your body in good shape. And then networking goes back to that relationship. Um, and really the friendships that you build key of, I would not have gotten really anywhere in my career had it not been for networking. From, like I said, that initial career fair at my college where I put myself out there to go and say, hey, I'm looking for a job and this is the type of job I want. Um, it, it's really, key to just put yourself out there and be really clear on what you're looking for, even if that's just general experience. Um, in terms of attitudes, confidence, but not cockiness, um, having the willingness to be wrong and take the first step anyways goes a long way. Um, modesty in your skill set, being level-headed, a sense of humor, grit. And when I say grit, it's um, what I've heard a lot of folks kind of call it is embracing the suck of Things aren't going well. Things might be really tough at that point in time, but um, pushing through it and getting the job done goes a long ways and folks will go and want to work with you in the future if you've got some grit. Um, general self-awareness and then patience with yourself and other people. Some of the KSAs that I've developed in fire that serve me in life, big one goes back to mechanical, driving and towing. Um, as somebody that grew up in a farm town in Central California, in suburbia, I did not get to work on four-wheel driving or towing, and FIRE really taught me that skill set that has served me very well, not only in my career, but outside of it. Um, for a big middle chunk of that career path that I showed you, I was living in a 19-foot trailer to go and travel between jobs, and having the knowledge of how to hook up that trailer and tow it by myself for three, five years really paid off personally of saved a lot of money in just having that knowledge. Um, equipment operation, knowing how to work a chainsaw. Um, every time we get a big windstorm here in my neighborhood, I go around and help a lot of the folks uh, cut up branches that have fallen on houses. It, it goes a long ways just in your personal life. Situational awareness and just botany. Um, if you're a big nerd and or just somebody that likes being aware of your area, knowing what's growing around you can go a long ways. Um, a good hobby to pick up if you're looking for something that coincides with a heavy, <laughs> heavy work workload and a, a busy work life. Um, skills are, are the same, and I would say attitudes are, are really the same too. Of a lot of what you learn in fire, you can take other places, and um, it's a very accessible and applicable skill set. For getting a career. Again, I will highlight that it took me years to get a perm, and I was really intentional about the jobs that I was taking and the direction that I was going. Um, I wanted to work for all lands and work in fuels and prescribed fire, and in, uh, working towards a fire ecologist position that was working at that big all lands level to serve everybody in a community was really important to me, but those jobs aren't necessarily, um, they're not always available, and Folks that tend to get into them, stay in them. So 
really open yourself up to traveling to new duties and places. And especially if you're young and you can travel, take the opportunity. You won't regret it. Um, I mentioned before I've been going in a slightly different direction than just operations recently. And I would highly suggest to everybody, especially early on in your career, try and do a detail or a fill-in as a support role. So going to your dispatch for at least two weeks, um, tying in with a training officer and seeing what their job looks like, working in other IMT positions rather than just operations. Um, a lot of folks find that their jam may not be operations in the long term. And again, you're a critical part of the team, even if you're not necessarily on the line every day. Um, a big part of the career that I found to be especially helpful is finding mentors. So find somebody that's willing to take you under their wing who maybe went down a similar career path that you're interested in and have them help you or ask, ask for help along the way of events that you can go to, people that you should talk to, um, if they see jobs come up that they think that you might be a good fit for, um, good references really go a long way in, in getting a career. And then having a broad goal, again, not being so specific that you're only going to one location for one job that may never open up, but really what do you want to do? What, what brings you satisfaction in your career and, and in your personal life? Um, Nolan really harped on that work-life balance, and that's a big part of it. Of maybe your broad goal in mind is really working hard and, and being a fire dog for a few years, but in the end, you want a family, you want to um, maybe move closer to families that you've moved away from for school or work. And that's a really good goal to have in mind for the long term, you know, 20 years down the line. And then focusing on and staying up to date on actual hard skill development. And again, I'm going to go back to the tech and the GIS aspect of that. Of There's some really hard skills that I see come up more and more on job announcements of Employers now are, are assuming that there's not just going to be a GIS specialist in the office, but that you'll be able to take on a lot of work. And with the rate at which things change, it's really important to kind of stay up to date on what's coming up. Um, if you can, if you see workshops coming on, try and sign up. And then being successful in, in career and life, uh, saying yes and volunteering, take the jobs that nobody else wants. Um, good to build that grit and good to put yourself out there. Fill in your own cup first, so you can't help others if, if you have nothing to give. So making sure that your tank's full before you really overextend yourself. And some great advice that I heard actually from Stephen Dubner, if anybody else is a Freakonomics fan, is uh, he has this, this podcast where he and Angela Duckworth, who, who wrote this book on grit, they talk about how great employees and employers tend to be at least two of the following of a thinker, a doer, or a charmer. So most of us tend to just be one, but a great employee is two. Like, don't just be a thinker, be a thinker that can follow through and get the job done. Or if you can think it, convince other folks to sign up for it. Be the charmer that brings other folks to the table. Um, but thinking about it in that way and structuring kind of what you're working on and just skill development personally can be really helpful. And generally work to understand the big picture, where you're going, where do you fit into the overall structure? What do you want to see for fire management in your part of the country and the country as a whole in the world? Um, networking and being really open about your interests and what kind of fills your cup. And then just generally being kind. Um, a lot of folks will reach out to work with you if, if you're kind and responding um, directly, but with kindness. And with that, that's all I've got. Heather, did you want us to do the quick overview oh, of the DNR? Yes, yes I, thank you, thank you, I almost forgot that. Um, let me share my screen here. And Nolan, I would greatly appreciate help in explaining the map. <laughs> oh boy, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Where do you want me to start? Um, right, I think the right there. So where your cursor's at is pretty much like the, the actual dedicated fire side. Yep. Mm -hmm. Roll out, yeah, perfect. So the way that Washington DNR is organized or kind of an easier way of thinking about it is that you have this division level and then the regional level. 
And division level, often you can think of as being the overarching kind of statewide level of management. So if you're working for division, you may be assigned to a certain geography, but really you're working at kind of this overhead, big picture idea. Regional staffing is really the boots on the ground. And so each region is, you can think of it as kind of its own forest if you're used to thinking about how the Forest Service operates, but they have their kind of jurisdictional boundaries and they are really um, calling the shots for, for how they, they manage within their region. So feel free to jump in, Nolan, if you see any uh, mistypings for how I laid it out, but in our fire staff, we have a wildland fire management division and their staff in the region, that's where you would get on with an engine or a hand crew. You start as a firefighter type two, move up to some sort of module lead. Um, we do have fire training specialists that are attached specifically to the regions. We have heavy equipment operators, and you'd essentially move your, if you wanted to stay in a, a traditional fire track, move your way up the ranks to become a fire unit manager, a fire district manager, all the way up to managing wildland fire management for that whole region. Um, we also have dispatchers for the east side of our state. They're embedded within the interagency dispatch centers. So you'd be working alongside Forest Service folks um, and our, our federal partners. But um, dispatching is, again, a very noble job that is very necessary to get the work done. And then we also have some fire fiscal analysts. So if you're more into the business side of things, if you've ever thought about getting your MBA, um, there is no shortage of need for folks that have a mind for finance and are willing to play around with our big numbers. Nolan, do you want to cover the the service forestry and state land yeah. side? Yeah, and and so Kate laid it out pretty well the difference sort of between the division and the in the regions. Um, I work for a region. Um, where where I sit. So um, we work closely with our forest resilience division in, in terms of how we allocate budgets and things like that. And, and then um, also for, for applying for federal grants. But yeah, I, I work for a district manager. You can see this whole serv service forestry coordinator somewhere in there and on the region side. Um, but yeah, it, and then I have foresters in in my area that work for me um, here in central Washington. So um, it's kind of weird. We used to be together with fire, but now we're separate from fire, which I, I think is probably, uh, well, yeah, there's there's goods and bads of that. But uh, I like to think of us and like essentially as sort of the fuels side of the shop, although we're much more than that, I, I would say. And then um, in addition to just the normal service forestry pathway, which, you know, from my standpoint, skills that feed into that are just some basic forestry skills, along with, a, you know, pretty robust fire background. That, that seems like those skills translate almost directly into service forestry and, and what we're coaching our landowners to do oftentimes. But then there's also in, in working for the region is the whole uh, state land. So the folks that actually work on DNR managed lands and setting up timber sales, um, setting up agriculture leases. Um, I was surprised to learn sort of the diversity of the state portfolio and works that, that our state lands staff is, is doing. So um, that's just a, a different pathway in terms of uh, and different skill set that, that folks do. DNR is um, probably similar to the way the Forest Service used to be like 20 years ago, where we have a strong militia component still helping support our fire program, which is great. Um, so uh, uh, we draw heavily on our state lands and then in, from my shop as well with the service forestry shop to, to all sort of pitch in come fire season. So um, from the region standpoint, those are a few of the areas that, that we sort of uh, work on. We're essentially, I, I'd say the more operational side of of receiving direction from Olympia through our region managers to, to make sure we're managing our lands and helping the private land um, side of things. So hopefully that lays it out a little bit. <laughs> awesome, that's great. And so fire science stuff to, to, to dive in for if you didn't necessarily have a strong background in operations, but you were really interested in going through getting your master's 
as you can see where Heather's right at now, within our force resilience division, we do have a number of scientists that all have at least a master's, if not a PhD. So we have fire scientists that are going and running these really large scale fire modeling systems that are helping our, our managers in the regions figure out where to engage. We're about to hire a post fire recovery program manager that again is looking at statewide across all lands. How do we start helping with this fire recovery after all these large wildfires coming through? Um, we also have ecologists that work for our, our state land side. So if you wanted to keep a, a very small hand in fire and help burn when it came through on your property, but you were really interested in mainly being an ecologist, we also hire those folks and they're they're scattered all throughout the state. So lots lots of diversity in what you can do and like what Nolan just said is militia is really strong here and because the state is is not only managing our own land but also helping private landowners um, there's just a lot of opportunities to to participate in fire either wildfire suppression or in prescribed fire 